It's good to see all of you and to our online community. Uh, we welcome you in the name of Christ as well. I'm Hazel McKay, the senior pastor. Uh, if there are needs online, please make those uh, aware to us, prayer needs, whatever it might be, or you can um, do a private message to uh, Kyle or one of our staff members, and we will definitely uh, address those uh, issues of prayer. We are praying for people continually. There are a number of people we receive through the online ministry weekly. And um, so those are, also, those are being prayed for, just like every prayer concern that's li listed at Covenant. So uh, be mindful of that, but glad you would come out today. And um, we appreciate very much this, this time together. You know, uh, they said it was going to get cold, didn't they? And uh, they were correct. And so uh, uh, I give a good shout out. The TV guys were saying, hey, guys and gals were saying, hey, it's going to get cold. And I woke up and I went, man, it's not. Oh. So anyway, it was cold. Hope everybody's good and well. And um, we should have charged about six bucks a cup of coffee is what we should have done if I was a good marketer. But no, we're, thankfully that you're here. Now, we're in a series of sermons called Love Like That. And uh, it's a book written by Les Perry. Um, what we're doing is we're taking the ideas, and we spent last week, you, might, you can catch it online or YouTube or wherever you'd like, uh, the, the message was about uh, really the first priority is to give our lives to Jesus, that no relationship works, no relationship works without Jesus being the center. That was the premise, that was the message last week. Today, we're, we're building upon love like that where you remember when Jesus said, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your strength and soul and mind. And uh, so we're, we're building upon those qualities over the next few Sundays. And today we're going to look at what it means to be mindful, what it means to be mindful. And I think you're going to see how uh, what you see uh, affects what you think and, and, and what you take into your life and how you then appropriate it and how I appropriate it. So I hope you'll follow along and uh, we have some good scriptures. Matter of fact, I think they're going to be very familiar to you, uh, but that could be such a good thing to kind of re-engage the, uh, the word that you study and, and then study again and go, oh, I didn't see that and now I see it this time. So that's good stuff like that. So I'm glad you're here today. Uh, always encourage others to join us online or on campus, and we're also encouraging you, you know, please take care of yourselves uh, in this COVID uh, time as well. Uh, let's pray. God, into these moments we speak to you, and we offer ourselves to you. And right now, it's, it's heavy on my heart, and I suspect on many, that there are people who need our prayers. And so, Father, we, we lift up so many people in our church right now that are struggling with illness and struggling with relationships. We have had people week after week after week asking you to heal them in their marriage. God, make your presence known. Week after week, we've had people acknowledging the very same illness that someone is battling. God, we pray for healing. In these times together, we ask that you would open our minds to hear the incredible gift of your word and that it would come alive within us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord. And everybody said, amen. Okay. When you were growing up, I don't know if you all had this experience, so I'm not going to group us all together, but maybe, maybe I'll be able to tell or I can hear from you. Uh, when, when you were growing up, or a lot of us growing up, there were some words that our parents said to us over and over and over again. And one of the things that we heard, at least, like I said, it may be generational, I'm not sure, but one of the things that uh, I heard, and I suspect many of you heard, was, mind your manners. <laughs> like I said, that was going to be generational. The, the thing I heard growing up and um, what some of us heard was mind your manners. And man, that was, a, that was a deal breaker in the house. And it was a deal breaker if you ever went to someone's house. Your parents would say, mind your manners. And it usually meant 
two things, and I'm not going to ask you since you failed the course. I'm not going to ask you. But it usually meant two things. One is you make sure you always say please. And the other is you would say thank you. I thought I'd go ahead and say it too. Thank you. And that was mind your manners. So those of you who maybe had another thought, that was the mind your manners. And we heard that a lot growing up. At least, like I said, it could be generational. And that really is. That, that could be very true. But mind your manners. <clears throat> and that was the idea. Pay attention. <clears throat> Focus on your manners. So always remember, wherever you are, remember who you are. Remember to say please and remember to say thank you. Now, we, we have a new idea, and y'all jumped the gun on that. Mind your own. Yeah, now that's where we are today. Today, it's kind of like, uh, it's not mind your manners, it's mind your own business. You know, uh, uh, you, know uh, you do you. You do you. <clears throat> and I'll take care of me. And that's how we'll live our lives. Mind your own business. You know, you, you know, you just own up to your own affairs. You, you just own up to your own dealings. You just own up to everything that you're having to deal with in life. You, you, you do you. So mind your own business. You know, I, you know, and you think about that, it's kind of funny to hear that because it really is a cultural thing, mind your own business. And, uh, and, but but when, you, when, when you're social media savvy, I mean, we don't mind our own business. We stalk everybody in the world. So it's kind of funny that we would say, mind your own business, when we're out there going, oh, look what she's doing tonight. Mm. Or look what he's doing, you know, or, what, or whatever. Uh, oh, I wouldn't have worn that out. Oh, my gosh. Or whatever it is. Mind your own business. And so that's another term that we hear. And uh, what we're going to focus on uh, in this, this time together is what it means to be mindful, to be attentive, to be focused. Well, what does that mean for us in our relationships with other people and also in our relationship and walk with God? And it, those two factors are key, that connection with God, to be mindful of God and to be mindful of the people that we have relationships w with. It's a wonderful biblical concept. Now, I want us to focus again on the passage I read last week because I really want this to be something that you saturate in your life. And it's Ephesians 5. Paul wrote this from prison. He writes it to the church in Ephesus, and it's verses 1 and 2, and I want you to read it with me, but this is from the message, so it's a little different kind of take on the, uh, the translation, okay? But uh, join me in reading this as a reminder of, of, uh, of this love like that, okay? Here we go. Watch what God does, and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from, I, I love that, I'm sorry, proper, proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. And that's really what is being given to us from Paul love like that. I love the way that comes kind of, it just sort of comes to life when you read it from the message and all that it means for us. Mindful. What does it mean to be mindful in a relationship? What does it mean to be mindful in our walk with God? One thing for sure is to be attentive. Now, I'm not talking about perfect attention. I'm not talking about that at all, but to be attentive, to, to express affectionate interest. And you're not going to get that right 100% of the time. You're not going to get that right with God 100% of the time. So you're certainly not going to get it right with a spouse or someone you're dating. You're not going to get that right 100% of the time. But the beautiful thing about being mindful is this. Jesus saw what others missed. And this is, you know, to me, this is what's so important. How Jesus could look into your eyes and see things about your life that if I looked into your eyes, I would get bored. No. But when Jesus looks, he sees things that I miss. He sees things that you miss. Jesus is mindful. 
And I think this is an important quality for you and for me to, to be able to see with the eyes of Jesus, but it's not easy. Matter of fact, it's very difficult to see with the eyes of Christ when you're driving your car on the circle, right? I mean, you're, you're now dealing with people that uh, are not driving with their eyes open, but they're driving their eyes closed, it looks like, some of the times. But remember this, being mindful. Jesus saw what other people missed. Now, the, the follow-up to that is, what does that mean for us? Well, it means spiritual eyesight. It means that if you're really going to have a quality relationship, and I told you last week, a quality relationship always begins with a relationship with Christ. And then how that relationship is we love Christ, we love others. We love them more completely. But in this sense, I want you to know to be mindful means to have spiritual eyesight. Sp not, not judgmental eyesight. That, that, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. So if you've ever had an encounter with someone like that where they think they're super spiritual, but all they are are judgmental people, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that are able to open up their blind eyes. They, they once were blind, if you, if you know what I mean. And, and now they can see so many characteristics of the Messiah in their journey. They, they can see so many characteristics of love and loving others in their own personal journey. And so spiritual eyesight will always help you to see with the eyes of Jesus. It will. And it won't be perfect, but I've got to tell you this, to be mindful in your relationship, you want to be able to look at your spouse with the eyes of Jesus on occasion. Because if not, you might look at him with the devil's eyes, right? Or you might look at him with a hateful eye or a whatever eye. You know what I mean? I mean, you know. Or if you're dating, you may do the very same thing. I'm looking at you like the devil right now. And, you know, because you hurt my feelings or whatever. But what is being invited in a relationship to be mindful, to love the Lord your God with all your mind, is to have spiritual eyesight that takes you to the quality, if you will, to the quality of Jesus, for me, for you. Let me show you what I mean. And let's, let's read a scripture passage that today you know, but yet I hope it'll bless you. I'm not gonna read all of it, but it's, um, it's in Luke 24, if you wanna use your Bibles. If not, we'll, we'll show it to you right here. Luke 24, okay? Now this, this, uh, this is part of it. I'm sorry, this is one part of the story, and then I've got a couple others. But this is, real, I love this, this part of the story. Now, this is after Jesus. I mean, you know, now everybody, there's, there's a word out there that Jesus might be alive. And the crucifixion had taken place, and people are wondering, and is he alive? Is he not? Well, I've seen him. Well, I haven't. And everybody is out there, and it's just, oh, I'm, I mean, you know, everyone is wondering. And there's two disciples. We know for sure one of them is Cleopas, but we don't know the other's name probably, you know, we can always guess, but anyway, here we go. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. That's where they're headed, okay? These are people who follow Jesus. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, the crucifixion and how painful it was and the sadness and how hurt they were. I mean, that's what they saw. Get that in your mind. That's what they saw. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, look who shows up. Jesus himself came up, and he walked along with them. I, you know, and that's just kind of amazing. What did that look like? What, what was that? What kind of experience? You know, did he come up beside him and go, hey, what's up? Or, or did he have on clothing that they could not recognize? Well, watch this. But they were kept from recognizing him. So... Jesus comes alongside them, and yet they don't recognize him. Some of the disciples, now get this, did not recognize Jesus. And after spending a considerable amount of time with him, you know, some up to at least three years, I mean, you would think that they might know who this is, but they do not know who it is. And so Jesus is about to give the big reveal in just a moment. He's about to give the great reveal. But I want to ask you a very serious question. Now think about this. How could you, or how in the world could you fail to see something 
that is right before your eyes. Take your time. How in the world could you fail to see something that is right before your eyes? And I think about it a lot. I mean, if, it depends on where you are, right? Sometimes it depends on where you are. It depends on where you're going. It depends on if you're driving or not, or all those kinds of things. It's, it's like I've said before, you know, sometimes you're, you're driving along, and, and the person in front of you, uh, you know, maybe they stayed at a light just a little too long, you know, two and a half seconds, and you got to get them going. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, and, and they're not paying attention to the light turning green because they're texting, and then you, you know, you want to make a little remark and then you, you know, or whatever, and then you, you, you'll go on from there. But why is it so easy to miss the obvious in our lives? I mean, why is it so obvious? Well, the truth is, it's because, and this is going to sound weird, we see me. And when I say me, I don't mean me. I mean, you, you see you and I see myself. The reason why so often we miss the obvious is because we're looking at ourselves. It's like we have this perceptual blindness. We look, but we fail to see. You know, we we become blind to what's going on in plain sight. We become blind to it. And it happens to so many of us. It just happens in our relationships. This can happen exactly like this in our relationships. Just to miss out on what's the obvious, what's so, ob- you know, it's, it's perceptual blindness. But the important thing is, what I want to show you is Jesus is going to show us in a moment how to, how to see. And before we do, I want you to look at verses 30 and 31 and 32. So now, They're at the table, and they're getting ready to have the Lord's Supper together. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, and this is Emmaus, and they're going, you know, to Jerusalem. All right, and here they are with Jesus, and they don't know who he is yet. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then watch what happens. Then their eyes were opened. In the breaking of the bread, in the drinking of the cup, they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we'd, he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? It was kind of like this. I mean, we were already active and alive and engaged just walking with him, not even knowing who he was, not even knowing that that was Jesus. And so in this moment, in the breaking of the bread and the giving of the juice, and, um, you know, we, we plan to do that a little bit more. We were being just real, real careful, you know, with COVID and all that. And, but we do want you to have that experience, of course. And, and I want you to know that. But, but I want you to know in this moment, it's the breaking of the bread, the giving of the It's the body and the blood of Christ that awakens them to see. And this is real important. If you're going to be mindful of others, it's when you understand the brokenness of Christ and the giving of Christ himself for us that we begin to come alive. And no longer is it we see me. It's now about seeing who Christ is. Jesus shows us how to see. He is the only one that shows us how to see in life. And it has to do with that attention. It has to do with seeing things that you and I just overlook. Watch this in Matthew 17. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 15 through 17. Now, this family is real concerned about their child. And their child is having major physical trouble. And this is what happens. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I mean, this is bad news, y'all. I mean, this guy is so sick, he'll either burn in a fire or he'll go into the water and nearly drown. I mean, this is a real dilemma for this family. I brought him to your disciples. Now watch this. I brought him to your disciples. Don't you love that? And they couldn't do a thing. 
and they could not heal him. And then watch. Jesus looks. And you may think he's looking at the family, but he's looking at the disciples. And watch what, and watch what he says. You unbelieving and perverse generation. That is such a nice thing, isn't it? I mean, this is like, oh, you know, Peter's probably over there like that, you know, and John, and Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. And Jesus says, I, I showed you, I'm, I'm available to you to teach you how to see, and you can't see. Jesus could see what other people didn't see. And Jesus would challenge his disciples and say, how long do I have to be with you on this? How long? You just can't see it. You're not mindful. And it's just a very, it's, it's a heavy moment for the disciples. It's kind of like, well, I mean, we tried. You know, we gave it our best shot. We gave it our best. And then y'all know the story of Zacchaeus, right? Most of you know the story of Zacchaeus in, in uh, Luke's gospel. You can find it in Luke 19 if you want. But, um, and you know the story of Zacchaeus. And he is a tax collector and he's very wealthy and, and um, got a lot of influence. And uh, he's the chief tax collector. And um, Jesus is making his way to Jericho, and that's where Zacchaeus is, if you didn't know. Jesus is traveling around, teaching and preaching, and he's making his way to Jericho. And uh, Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. He had heard everything about him, and he wanted to see him. So if you remember, what he did was, because he was short in stature and probably short in, 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 his, in his heart, he runs ahead, and he jumps up, you know, in a sycamore fig tree. And he jumps in that tree, and he wants to see Jesus. And and you know what happens as Jesus makes his way through Jericho. He looks up at that tree and he says, hey, Z, hey, Z, you come down. We're going to go to your house today. That's what we're going to do. And I got to tell you right now, and you know it, but I want to remind you right now, tax collectors were so bad. They were so bad that they had their own category for sin. That's when you're good. I mean, well, that's when you're bad. I want you to think about that. In, in the first century, there was a category for sinners, long listing of all kinds of sins, and then another listing of tax collector. And that's bad, folks, because usually that was the statement, you know, you brood of vipers, you're like tax collectors and sinners. These major categories, and one was to be a tax collector. So what do we know about Zacchaeus? What do we really know about him? Well, here's what I want you to remember. Zacchaeus was a Jew. And what's even more important that I don't want you to miss is this. Zacchaeus' name was Righteous One. Isn't that amazing? His name was Righteous One. And I'm sure it didn't go well with everybody in the community, but he's a raised Jew. He was a chief tax collector. Now, I don't want you to miss this. He's a chief tax collector. A chief tax collector is over all tax collectors in the region. So the chief tax collector gets a cut from everybody. From every tax collector there is, Zacchaeus would get a cut. He has lots and lots of money. Rome employed him. And so people hate Zacchaeus, because not only is he a chief tax collector and takes money from his own people, but also he has given his allegiance to Rome. And so he overtaxes people, he has become rich, and he is hated by everyone. Now this is what I want you to understand. So when Jesus, now, now you need to know who Zacchaeus is, and we, many of you know him. And you've sang the songs. Zacchaeus was a wee little, you know. But we, we've done all that. But I want you to see Zacchaeus. I, I want you to see him beyond all of that. I want you to see him for a person who is broken. A person who is hated. 
and, and he's lost. He is lost. Have you ever noticed that when you're in a crowd, have you ever noticed this when you're in a crowd, you kind of see the crowd rather than the individual? You ever, you ever noticed whenever you're in a crowd, you tend to see the crowd rather than the individual? I, uh, <clears throat> I've been to um, a couple of uh, football games where I was very privileged at, uh, at Auburn to, to sit in the, uh, the president's box. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, it wasn't me. It was Dr. Stigall, my mentor, got the tickets. And, uh, but the, the, uh, one of the trustees, actually, uh, his wife was a young lady that was in my youth group many, many years ago. And so I went to the game, Auburn and Mississippi State. Y'all remember that? Everybody who's an Auburn fan, take a moment and moan. Mm, uh, anyway, and so I went to that game, and I want to tell you, it was a, it was a packed house, but I must tell you, the food was exceptional in the president's box. And, uh, and that was uh, before I got on, you know, my medicine that sometimes, you know, doesn't make me want to eat as much. And so, uh, so I was, uh, man, I was eating that day, and it was good. It was so good. And so I mean, it's a huge crowd. So I decided to take pictures, as I should, and send them to some of the sinners from our church who were at the game. And so I did that. I, t I took picture, you know, like of the shrimp and then the steak. And I'm not kidding. It was good. And I had eaten a lot of it. And so I took pictures and then I would send it to them, you know, and talk about the menu. And, and uh, so one guy who's really into the game and uh, Auburn was losing uh, to Mississippi State sent back a text for the rest of the people I was texting. And he said, do you not know there is a game going on? Do you not know that there is a game going on. And I was thinking, you know, it, it's, hard, it's hard when you're in a crowd, you know, to see the individual. And, uh, and I want you to think about that. I find it fascinating that Jesus could see Zacchaeus when no one else wanted to and when no one else could. And I really think that's a message for you and me. I think Jesus sees you today, right now, in your life, in your moments of good, difficult, challenge, heartache. He sees you. And even in this crowd, you might think maybe he doesn't, but he does. You know what I love about Jesus? He goes to a well and he can see the woman and no one can see her. And Jesus saw the woman at the well. The, the beautiful thing, folks, about Jesus is he can see a crowd. You and I tend to look at the crowd, and Jesus sees the individual. And I want you to understand that is so important in our relationships. I've had people in our, even in our church, um, before the pandemic, when, when our numbers were twice as big as they are right now. Uh, of course, online is very large. But I want you to know, you, you know, I, I will see people sometimes and we're all talking and visiting somewhere and they all go, you go to Covenant? Yeah, well, I go to Covenant. Well, I didn't know you went to Covenant. And, you know, and it was the crowd. And you're just going, well, I didn't know that. I didn't even know, you know, because the church has a number of services. And so you're like, well, I, I've, never been, I've never even been to whatever service. And they go, yeah, yeah, I go there. So often, that can happen to us. We can see the crowd, but we can't see Jesus. Tax collectors were considered awful people. They were, if you will, the worst of the worst. I mean, they were. They were the worst of the worst. And Christ gives an invitation to Zacchaeus, and I want you to understand this, because this is important about him becoming mindful. He gives an invitation to Zacchaeus to come. Uh, matter of fact, it's an invitation to go to his house. So he invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. And Zacchaeus is thrilled. So now let me remind you something about the Bible, okay? Real quick, real quick, you need to know this. This is the law of the day. The law of the day if you did something wrong to someone else, okay? This is the first century law of the day. You have to confess your crime. Man, I mean, wouldn't that be something? You have to confess your crime. You have to do it 
uh, before the people, uh, probably before the synagogue rabbi, and then you have to restore what you took from that person and then uh, give more than that, about a fifth more. So whatever you took, then you add a fifth to it. And then you have to come to the synagogue and give an offering to the Lord. I'm liking this, aren't y'all? Y'all would be driving by the church every day. That'd be a line so long. Anyway, then if you stole something that you could not restore, you had to repay it four times. So if you stole something and you couldn't repay it, you had to, you had to find a way to repay four times. Here's the other thing. If you were caught with the goods that you stole, if you were caught with them, you had to repay double. Okay, that was the message, that was the reality of the culture of the day. And Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus offers to pay the highest price to anyone that he has offended. Once he encounters Jesus, once that experience has happened in his life, he welcomes him joyfully, and then he says, I will pay back anything for all that Christ has done for me. So his feeling of being excluded, now Jesus has included him. And I want you to hear that now in your own relationships with people. Where, he, where, where, where so often we're tempted to see, like in the Bible or whatever, a paralyzed man, Jesus sees a man of faith. Where, where others see like a political traitor, Jesus sees a new disciple. Where others see crowds of harassing people, <laughs> Jesus sees people being harassed. Where others see sinners, Jesus sees mercy. Mercy. Because Jesus was mindful. He was mindful. Do you know what the reality of mindful is? The reality of mindful is that there is good to be found right now. That's the idea. That Jesus being mindful. You being mindful. Think about this right now in your own relationship. Whatever it is. Friendship. Marriage. Dating. Whatever it is. To be able to say, I will be mindful because Christ lives in me. And then as you begin to walk in Christ, you say, there is something good to be found right now. Now, of course, if you're in an abusive relationship and it's emotional or physical, now listen, all bets are off. I want you to get a counselor. That's a whole other story, okay? But I'm talking to those of you who are just, you're on that journey. Some days are good. Some days are not so good. And I'm saying to you that the idea of being mindful, there is good to be found that's what it means to be mindful. Let me ask you right now, what keeps us from seeing? What keeps us from seeing the good that can be found? Well, here's the answer that I have. It's our agenda. Our agenda. I mean, there, it's, it's, it's just we have this agenda, and the agenda is all about us. And it's all about what we want. The agenda is us. I, 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 did some, uh, I did some study with a great theologian, uh, Google. And I Googled, and I, I found out um, the definition, if you will, for, uh, for this, this idea of, um, of an agenda. Okay? And this is what it said. A person having their own plans for what they want to do. Most likely for their own benefit. That's an agenda. And I think that's why we can't see Jesus. And I think that's why we can't see other people. Because our agenda is pretty big. And it's built around our own personal benefits. The greatness of King David. You remember King David in the Old Testament? His greatness, he's a wonderful warrior. Um, brilliant, sharp, 
led the nation of Israel incredibly well. But remember his problem. His problem was his own agenda. And remember in that his own agenda, he began to look at Bathsheba because she was taking a bath and and she's beautiful and he wants her. That's on the agenda. And then she has a husband because now there's a problem because she's with child and so he has to get rid of Uriah. That's on the agenda. Do you see how dark an agenda can become in our lives? I mean, I'm not saying that any of us would fall prey to that, but what I'm saying is there is nothing more. I mean, an agenda is nothing more than an immediate goal. So, so right now, think about that. Your, the agenda that you have, it's usually just an immediate goal that you have right now. That's what's pressing you. That's what's pressing your life, an immediate goal. It does it to all of us. And it's why it messes us up so badly. And it keeps us from seeing the way that Jesus wants us to see. I mean, it really does. Being mindful like Jesus means in every situation, with every person, with every moment, remember, there is good to be found right now. That is being mindful in Christ in our relationships and with God. God, I, I trust you. I live in you. I want to serve you. Listen to what Paul says. He writes again from a prison cell. He did that a lot. In Philippians, he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Man, that was pretty heavy. Do nothing out of agenda. Rather, it doesn't mean you can't have an agenda, but I'm talking about when that agenda becomes destructive to you and to others. Rather in humility, surrendering yourself, surrendering yourself, humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the other. Now that's not easy. That's hard. Matter of fact, that is the greatest struggle of life, if you want to be honest. It's when you're willing to kind of take your agenda, and this is the hardest thing for any of us. Take our agenda and lay it down at the feet of Jesus and say, I want your agenda, Lord. And I'm going to tell you what Paul is actually telling you in Philippians. He's saying that when you make your agenda more important than anything else in your walk with God and with others and your love and your care for your family, whatever, you make your agenda more important, God's going to bring inconveniences into your life. Hear me. He's going to bring inconveniences into your life so that you discover an agenda that moves you closer to Christ. That's what Paul is saying. So what about you? How is God prompting you? How is he? How, how is he prompting you with your agenda. If, if you say right now, I really want to deal with this haze, but I just don't know how. I don't, I don't know exactly how to discover what, what it is. Well, his half-brother tells you, James, tells you how to do it. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. That means go to God first, right? Who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. What he says is, set your agenda down at the feet of Jesus and then whatever inconveniences that are going on right now, let them make you mindful of where God is leading you. Because God will lead you, and he's going to lead you to something that is good. He's not going to lead you to something that's just awful. He's going to lead you to something that is good. So if you take the word wisdom and you look it up in Greek... It simply means clear. Isn't that amazing? That wisdom actually means to be clear. So to be mindful means to be clear. To be mindful means to be clear. And, and 
And this is what's so amazing, okay? This is, this is what's so amazing. You, you become clear with the big picture, and you become clear with the whisperings of God in your life, the whisperings. So to be mindful is to lay down that agenda and understand that the inconveniences that have been going on in your life are an opportunity for God to move you in a direction for his agenda for your life. Let's pray. God, we ask in these moments that your word just would come alive within us. And I know that for some of us today, some of us, we, we, we try so hard to see like Jesus, but our, our difficulty is more in the way in which we do it. We're trying to do it on our own. And Father, for us to be mindful, we pray that we would just lay down our agenda before you and understand there is good to be found right now in Christ. Forgive us when we make decisions that hurt others. Forgive us when we choose a way that is not of your calling and open our eyes to see like Jesus. If there's anyone today here or online who needs to say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I give you my agenda. I want you to know that he receives you with love, all love, all forgiveness, all grace. Father, we rejoice that you welcome us home each and every moment of life. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the people said, Amen. God bless you. Hope this helps you a little bit in your studies. And looking at some old texts can be so refreshing. So I encourage you to read those again. Uh, we will continue our study on uh, being strong in the Lord. And I uh, want to encourage you to come back next week. God bless you. Have a great day.